WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We're positively into the greatest time of the year. Not just the holiday season. No, no, no. It's the eggnog season, and it's Pittsburgh week. We're doing the Maryland Crab Cake Tour next week and this week. On Friday, we're going to be uh, down at Fadley celebrating uh, 31 years on the radio. Dan Roderick's going to be coming by talking about his amazing play, Baltimore, You Have No Idea. So I'm looking forward to that. Also going to have some other friends from the Maryland Lottery. Roz Lane will be joining us. And then next week, it is the 31st anniversary Rock Christmas celebration with Gina Shock from the Go-Go's. We have a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer in Dundalk. We'll be at Costas. That's next Thursday from 2 until 5. In the meantime, we got football to play this week and next week. On to Cleveland next week on short rest. But right in front of us, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I've heard this for years. Oh, they've fallen. They're no good. Who's their quarterback? The kid from Pitt? All of that stuff. Ravens better be worried this week. Will Graves has covered all things Pittsburgh, even though he is a Marylander, don't tell anybody, but he's been up Pittsburgh for a number of years, covering all things Pittsburgh sports for the Associated Press. You can follow along, at on Twitter, as well as anywhere good journalism is served. How have you been, Will Graves? What's going on? How's life in the Berg, uh, I'm I'm good. Um, my uh, my 13-year-old is on a uh, fitness kick. He decided over the summer he wanted to get himself in shape, and now he is inspired, actually, my wife and I, to sort of get in the mix too. I mean, like I'm always been like a cardio guy, but he's been lifting weights and stuff like that. And so he's like, got me into sort of lifting weights, which I guess is, uh, you know, good for him. Um, and well, it's you know, wonderful when your kids inspire you, right? Yeah. I mean, his dedication, he's almost like a monk. I mean, it's kind of weird. Like he, he's, he just decided, uh, like maybe like in April or may, like, Hey, I need to get in better shape. If I'm going to be, he's got, as he likes to say, he's got warning track power in baseball. He's trying to get the ball over the fence. So, uh, he's been, killing it and he's been stuck to it so religiously that my wife and I were like oh my god maybe he's on to something so he has inspired us and and uh my my 11 year old daughter's great she's an aspiring swimmer getting better every day and um and yeah and, and Pittsburgh's Pittsburgh it's it's sort of weird I mean you you just mentioned that they're you know they are in sort of like I, I would describe it as sort of a down ish for them in, as a city as a whole thing I mean when you the Steelers new new you know new era with Kenny Pickett coming on the pens are sort of older but they're still good but are they really good and then the pirates are the pirates of course um but yeah i mean if the orioles are in the market for a center fielder i would encourage them to uh you know send ben Char- or an outfielder or corner outfielder send ben Charrington a note to see uh what Brian Reynolds would go for but uh, other than that look i mean it's it's never boring and uh, for that i'm grateful All right, let's go Steelers here. Uh, You were not out on the field in Latrobe that day uh, when I showed up there on the muddy fields back in August to uh, reunite with Coach Tomlin and Burt Lawton. And uh, there was very little – the fun part about being on the sidelines today, it was the last day I've had a press pass this season, by the way. I'm out there with uh, some of your brethren, and everybody's fighting over whether a seven-on-seven interception is really an interception. That's what the reporting (laughs) level was in the first week of August, that how many to pick and throw? Where's Trubisky? Uh, What's going – like all of that. Have we settled now that this kid's going to at least be the quarterback this year, next year. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, mean I, I think the second that Mike T went to him at halftime of that Jets game, I mean, it was over for for better or for worse for Mitch Trubisky. I mean, the way that I look at it, what Kenny Pickett has done, and he's been okay. Um, Trubisky probably would be as good or not better this season than Kenny Pickett has been. However, you know, I guess the, the thought process is what is Kenny's ceiling versus what is Mitch's ceiling? And if Kenny's ceiling is higher, then you might as well start which they believe it is. You might as well start on that road as soon as possible, uh, which they've done. And he's been, he's been good. I mean, I, I don't want to, I'm not a, I consider myself like an agnostic because he played at Pitt. I watched him. I covered him for the, you know, the five years or four years before he got to Pitt and he's a good quarterback. But if you would ask people in the summer of 2020, do you think Kenny Pickett will be the franchise or 2021? If you, do you think Kenny Pickett will be the franchise quarterback for the Steelers after Ben Roethlisberger? They would have said no. He had one incredible year at Pitt, and he parlayed that into a first-round pick. I definitely think the hometown stuff played a part of it. I think if he went to Iowa State, I don't know if the Steelers draft him. I really do think that they – Why do they love him so much? I mean, and for everyone out there who doesn't know, they share the building, right? Like, I've been in that building, um, so I I know what it looks like, the cafeteria, all that stuff. But most – it's a most unusual thing. And then to right. select that quarterback from there and they've had running backs from there too. They, they recently, I mean, it feels like, um, you know, that, that sort of distance 
helps the Steelers to say, we'd like to have that guy and, and then go pick him. Right. Yeah. I mean, they did it with James Conner. Let's remember, you know, after who played at Pitt and, you know, had a very memorable bout with, uh, you know, cancer comes back. Great, great story. I mean, but th the thing is, he never really he had like a after Le'Veon, the year Le'Veon set out, James had a really good first eight, nine games. Then he got hurt. He was a pro bowler that year based mostly on the first half of that year. And then he never really quite lived up to what the team considered their his potential. Right. So then he goes to Arizona and they draft Najee Harris. I think it's the same way with Kenny. I, I think that the proximity might have skewed their evaluation a little bit. And I do not, and let me, it is, I've, I've been doing this a long time. Ness. I've, I've been 25 years a journalist, 11 years here in Pittsburgh. I have never, ever, ever covered an athlete that is more where the, the camps are more divided on whether he's good or he stinks than Kenny Pickett. It is bizarre. And I think part of that is there are people in this town that, you know, to borrow Dennis Green's phrase, wanted to crown him the second he got drafted. He had, you know, and I, I pointed this out several times during the spring and summer, he had one really great year at Pitt. You know who else had one really great year at college and parlayed that into a high NFL draft pick? Mitch Trubisky. Okay, so let's just, can we just like, and I, and I, and I, it's not fair to him. It's not fair to Kenny to put this on him this early in his career. Anybody who was going to have to follow Ben was going to have a, a, almost impossibly high standard to live up to. And now you're crowning this kid and he's, I mean, let's be honest, he's, he's done. Okay. Like his best, his best tribute now is like, he, he's not screwing up. Right. But he's got four touchdowns and eight starts. I mean, that's, but are they that's a very good elite. team. Let, you know, this is one of the evaluations we have with Lamar right now, because you can beat Lamar up all day, but Lamar didn't deal the wide receiver away. And then the next wide receiver get hurt and then have three running backs get injured and have a left tackle that, He's back, but he's not back, and then he's back, and he's the greatest when he's back, but when he's not there, we're playing with a third-string kid that has no business playing left tackle. Yeah, I mean, look, there are, you know, the, the offensive line has been in transition, although I think it's gotten, with the exception of left tackle Dan Moore, I would say in general the, the line is better than it was last year. Um, you know, they found they, – they've certainly looked like they've got somebody in George Pickens, a guy that's going to be a, a, a big-time playmaker for them. Um you, you know, he is sort of the, the, the offensive game plan is designed for him to not screw up, basically. Um, you know, like that was the whole process coming in. I mean, the, the formula for this team was to have great defense. You got three elite players, one at each level of defense and Cam Hayward and TJ Watt, Minka Fitzpatrick and and win field position battle. Don't you know, win the turnover battle and win games exactly like you saw against uh, against Atlanta 19 to 16. I mean, that led, it didn't matter who the quarterback was, whether it was Mitch or whether it was Kenny. Um, that is how this team is designed. And that's why I think, like, you could literally write 20 to 17 in for every single game the rest of the season. And I think you'll be right more often than you're going to be wrong. He is Will Graves. He covers all things Pittsburgh sports for the Associated Press. Uh, he is a Marylander by birth, but a Pittsburgher by work choice. And uh, what else do we need to know about the Steelers coming into this game in regard to how they're playing now? versus maybe what mess I saw six, eight, ten weeks ago. Because from the Ravens' perspective, we get the schedule, and we played all the East teams the beginning of the season, right. right? Miami, New England, the Jets, they were all supposed to stink. None of them, turns out, really stunk at all. Not even the Jets with Joe Flacco in week one stunk. And the Steelers and the Browns were supposed to stink, and we're supposed to get them at the end. And it looked real good two weeks ago. We look up three and eight, three and eight, four and seven, three and nine. Like, that was our schedule until you stub your toe against Jacksonville. You damn near lose to the Denver Broncos. Your quarterback gets hurt. And now, all of a sudden, two games against Pittsburgh the next three weeks doesn't sound like such a good idea. Yeah, I, I think, well, let, you know, let's remember T.J. Watt got hurt in that first game against uh, Cincinnati, which was – I mean, look, that was maybe one of the flukier games I've ever seen. I mean, the, ev by every right, the Bengals deserved to win that game, even though they turned it over five times and even though Joe Burrow got sacked seven times. Um, but the Steelers win because basically the long snapper for the Bengals gets hurt, which leads to a bad snap on an extra point at the last play of the game, bad snap on a short field goal. Um, and then they went into a funk. I mean, TJ was out. They did not – the defense, they can say what they want, next man up, whatever. There's nobody that does what TJ Watt does. And even now, he's look, he's not even close to 100%. You watch him play, he is not the T.J. Watt you saw last year when he was Defensive Player of the Year. But if he's on the field, you have to accommodate for him. You have to game plan for him because on any given play, he could be, you know, the T.J. Watt. So I think they've gotten it together. They figured out that the running game has really, really improved. I think it's five straight weeks, over 100 yards, um, including a 200-yard game against the Saints. 
you know, they they're willing to ground and pound. It's sort of a return. I'm, I'm not calling. I'm not saying Najee Harris is is Jerome Bettis by any stretch, but they have figured out. You know, let's control the clock. Their their time of possession is way up over what it was early in the season, which means the defense is rested in the second half of the games. And that was one of the problems early in the season. They they blew second half leads to teams like the Jets. You know, where they had or let's remember it was it, they were down a touchdown against the. Patriots, Patriots got the ball with six and a half minutes left. The defense had been on the field so much it just yielded, right? I mean, like they ran out the clock. So that's not happening anymore. Atlanta tried. Atlanta got close uh, last week, but the defense made the stops at the end and the offense played pretty well to, to, to close it out, essentially. So, I mean, I think they figured out who they are. I think it's, you know, it's it's almost weird. It's like um, the first six, seven weeks, it was almost every – Every single snap was like an, an indictment of Tomlin, an indictment of Matt Canada, an indictment of Kenny Pickett on how, how you felt about whether they, any of them were any good at their jobs. And I think everything is things have sort of leveled off. Kenny hasn't thrown a pick in four games. They're running the ball. They're winning. Tur- Wink- Minka Fitzpatrick is back. He missed, you know, he was out for a little bit. They are, I mean, they are who we thought they were. I mean, I, I think this is a, do I think this is a playoff team? No, but I also don't think when you look at the, the teams that are quote, bad although who knows on a given week i mean i saw the end i red zone i saw the end of that jacksonville baltimore game that was insane like i i was i could not believe that the jags went down the field on the ravens i have a lot of respect for baltimore i picked them to win the division before the season started um i still think they can but you know it is it is a week-to-week league and i think with the steelers you know i picked them to go nine and eight that looks certainly looks feasible um if they beat baltimore twice especially if lamar can't go i mean it sounds insane. They could get in as like the seventh seed, which is crazy. Well, Will, I was going to ask you, from the outside, it hasn't been a great year for the Steelers. You know the Steelers aren't going to the playoffs. You probably knew that before the season began and how the season began when the injury started to mount with Watt and they changed the quarterback. For the Ravens, it it always felt like last year was a, a little bit of a mulligan. Last time I talked to Harbaugh, he was apologizing, still apologizing for last year, six months later, because of the injuries, because of Lamar, right. because the defense was decimated, because they were 8-3 and three and fell apart. They're in that position right now where they could fall apart. John looked ashen on Monday in the press conference. Or maybe it was just the color of my TV screen. I'm not sure I wasn't there in person. But he he looked sort of crestfallen during Monday's press conference. You never would have known they had won. You would never would have known they're in first place. Uh, you would never see sort of the fire of Pittsburgh week. It feels to me like they're going to come up there and play with their backup quarterback again. And the notion of what the Ravens – are in the offseason and the mighty Lamar Jackson and the mighty defense and all the running backs and Mark Andrews. Boy, in week 12, week 13, as we get into this, it feels like they are the hobbled. And when I start to see Chase come back in Cincinnati and I see Deshaun Watson in in Cleveland and I see, you know, this maturation of Pickett, but I, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not saying he's uh, uh, you know, a credible NFL quarterback yet, but seeing this kid play through the first six, eight, ten weeks of his career with a, a capable organization to say, we're going to make you better. I, I I don't know that the Ravens are, as you said, I picked them to win the division. I don't know if we're picking them to win the division right now. I saw Joe Burrow play last week. Well, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, he is, um, I'm, look, I'm, I'm an older guy. I'm 48. I, I, I'm not a hot take guy. Um but man, watching Burrow, it is hard not to think of Joe Montana. It is just where they're, I mean, it, but you know, growing up in, in the, in the DC suburbs and the great, well, not great, but sort of great town of Waldorf, Maryland, which is mostly just gas stations and liquor stores and, uh, and chain restaurants. And Joe Theismann on satellite from time yeah. to time. <laughs> and, um, you know, where I used to dread, where I used to dread, um, Oh my God! When the, when Washington would play San Francisco, like oh God, you know how this is going to end. It's just going to end in a painful fashion. Burrow certainly looks like he's sort of brought that same. I mean, he's not because he's not like a Marvel, right? He's not a guy that he's not Lamar. He's not Mahomes. He's not. Ju- he's not even Justin Herbert. I mean, but he is. Just, I mean, he just. And I think because of that, it's almost like he's more appealing, right? Because you sit there and think, well, hell, that guy can do that. I can do that, right? I mean, he, he is not physically imposing, but man, he is. He is fun to watch. And to be honest with you, I mean, the, the seven-year-old me would tell you the first Super Bowl I ever watched was Cincinnati, San Francisco, when they played it in the Silverdome. And so, and I love seven years old Washington. I think it had gone eight and eight. That was Joe Gibbs' first year. So I wasn't really into them. 
but I remember that they, that was the year they changed their helmet. They changed the helmets. Yeah, yeah. Every so time I talked to like Solomon Wilcots or, you know, I talked to those guys in Cincinnati, you know, I'm like, yeah, that was 81. I remember and, it well because the Colts were here and I had tickets and my dad refused to go to the Colts game. I had to go see Chris Collinsworth play with right, the right. Zubaz helmets on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and so I, I've always sort of had a soft spot for them. And then Boomer going there and look, I, I, I even though I didn't go to Maryland, I went to WV, I still consider myself a Maryland guy. So I was rooting for Boomer. Uh, to perform well, um, you know, wanted him to do well there, and he did. So that, so I like have always sort of, kind of always kind of like them. And I, I'm a big believer in like, it, it's important for the league to teams to have bad stretches and good stretches. That's how it's supposed to work. Which is why these Steeler fans and have been spoiled. Be, and I've said this on TV, so I can say I certainly say it here. Uh, spoiled beyond belief, they, essentially for 50 years. I mean, there was a little bit of rough patch at the end of Noel. The Noel you know area. what it's like. You have the Pirates, too. So you, you know, we, we have the <laughs> Orioles here who haven't made the but World Series since 83, right? I mean, so. like, if you knew this was going to be a transition year for the Steelers, and yet they still couldn't handle it. I mean, <laughs> what, I mean, like, they're probably going to finish. Worst case, they're going to finish, like, 7 and 10, 8 and 9, which isn't, like, fall off a cliff bad. It's just like, well, we lost the Hall of Fame quarterback. What, do you, what did you expect to happen, right? So just, to me, to see Cincinnati be good, like, it's good for the league if Cincinnati is good. Like, I, I think they, it shows that that's how this is how the league is supposed to work. The irony is, like, now the Steelers fans find themselves in a weird spot. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do they want the team to have one atrocious year so they can pick, like, fourth in the draft? Or do they want to do what looks like it's going to happen? They're going to get eight and nine, nine and eight, seven and ten, and pick anywhere from, like, 15 to, to 18, where maybe you don't get that left tackle that you need, right? So that's the yin and the yang. for the, And I'm like – it's okay to have one bad year, but people are killing time. I mean, you know, it's so funny. Like right now, after they won last week, everybody's tweeting. They're in the hunt. They're in the hunt. They're not in the hunt yet. If they beat Baltimore, we can talk about it, but let's, they're still 12th in the conference. They're still last in the division because Cleveland beat them head to head. So, so the same team that people that are saying they're in the hunt are also the same people that give Tomlin no credit for doing what he does, which I consider him to be one of the top five coaches in the league. I mean, he does, he, he has not won Super Bowls all the time. And I certainly could say you could relitigate the mid twenties tens with the killer bees. Did they miss some opportunities? Kind of, but I mean, the Patriots are in the way for them, just like they were in the way for everybody else. Let's not pretend that like they kept, <clears throat> I mean, they had one fluke loss to Jacksonville, but for the most part, they have played, you know, like they, like it's okay. I mean, I would much rather look as a Washington fan, I'd much rather have, Mike Tomlin than than Ron Rivera. And I think 30, 28 to 30 other teams in the league would rather have Mike Tomlin than the guy they got in their job right now. So, you know, I I think it's the, I, the whole point of that was Joe Burrow's fun to watch. It, I hope that they can catch lightning in a bottle because I think it's good for the league. But, you know, at the same time, I, I think I still think the man, it's it sucks that I I enjoy watching Lamar. I, to be honest, the the Ravens are what the Steelers think they are. To be honest with you, I mean, the Ravens, they're almost become carbon copies of each other. They're consistently excellent. They, they're they well-coached, they're well-run, and they're competitive every year. And I don't know as a fan how you could how you could be upset with a team being competitive every year. I don't understand how that's not good enough. So that's the end of my Mike Tomlin defense. There. Will Graves is here. He is a make it. Well, I want you to make the Mike Tomlin defense because you really didn't do it. You just said, I like him. He's top five. What What is it about? him people you know like if you see him like he he will do like because we get to watch practice because we're in the locker room four or five days a week you see him interact with the players okay and he has a way about that himself with the players that you know it'd be nice if he would let the the guard down a little bit so people could see that during the games right but he doesn't he is a guy that it, you know to cover him is frustrating because you know he is just as funny as you think he is. He is just as direct and blunt as you think he is. But when we talk to him on the record, when we talk to him on the record, we hit record, he turns into a cop, right? It's like talking, it's like you got pulled over for a ticket and the guy's giving you a lecture on why he pulled you over for speeding. That is the the problem that I have with him is, is that his he doesn't really let his persona show through publicly a lot. And that's, look, that's part of that is, I mean, it's very much a conscious decision. Well, he's the only black coach. Let's start with that. He's the only black coach. He's the only black coach. And all the other black coaches get fired. He's the only black coach in a primarily white city. So let's let, let, let's let go to the root of that. And every time he's not 15 and one or 15 and two, there's a significant number of the fan base that want to fire him. Well, I mean, and it's, I mean, I think that's, this, you know, they say what, 
it's is it some of the fans that they criticize him would say isn't it okay to want to win the super bowl every year and it absolutely is but you have to be realistic. I mean, I, I because I work for the AP, I am always, always, always taking the 30,000 foot view. How did the Steelers fit in, you know, into as, to, as Mike would say, globally speaking, right? I mean, they are in a they're in a, a, a time of transition in the franchise as every team pretty much, unless you have a, a you know, an Aaron Rodgers or Patrick Mahomes waiting in the wings, you, you know, every team goes through this transition after they have a, a, a quarterback that plays at a high level lead. So you know, I think that, you know, it's interesting when they played the Colts a couple weeks ago, he was asked about the Jeff Saturday thing. Does it bother you? And he basically, I mean, Mike's a smart guy. He knows, he knows the role that he plays in the league. He also knows he has a team to coach. And if he come, if he shares his true feelings about what happened with Jeff Saturday being hired, that's all we're going to talk about during the week. And we're not going to be talking about his team. Right. So it is a very calculated decision. I just think like if fans could see him on a, on an everyday basis, like we have the opportunity to, I think they're, the fans that don't like him would come around. I mean, I just, it, it is impossible to be around him and not be like, man, this dude absolutely knows what he's doing. Will Graves is here. He knows what he's doing for the Associated Press. He's up in Pittsburgh uh, fighting through bad hockey and awful baseball and his kids' sports. and uh, Bad, it, bad hockey by by their standards, not but not bad, bad hockey. Well, I, you know, I've had a little hockey resurgence. I mean, Trotz did the show a couple weeks ago and uh, sent me. He said, give me your address. I got something for you. And I get an envelope of 1989, 90, and 91 <laughs> game programs from the Baltimore Skipjacks. So wow. on the cover is Tim Taylor, who wound up winning two Stanley Cups with the Red Wings. He played with the Rangers, got paid, got made, had another Stanley Cup with the Lightning. So I track him down. It turns out he's running pro personnel for the St. Louis Blues. So I'm doing like a little bit of hockey, but as I admitted to, to Tim Taylor – I have not watched, and this is true, I have not watched any hockey since I walked off the ice with Barry Trotz that night in Las Vegas five years ago. So I, I just okay. I just stonewalled hockey. I just decided I've had enough <laughs> hockey in my life at 50. I won the cup. It's DC's team. The owner's a jerk. I'm gone. So I've just moved on to, like, I don't know, collecting rock and roll belt buckles and, you know, writing again, you know. So right. I'm, I'm finding other hobbies for the Steelers and for – the, the rebuild that you talk about and where they are in this reload. Um, drafting in the middle, salary cap. What is their great hope other than this quarterback turns out to be a top 10 quarterback? I mean, I, I think that's certainly part of it. Um, they've got, I mean, Najee Harris, when he's healthy, he is a top 10, top 12 running back. They look like they've got their next Heath Miller and Pratt, Pat Fryermuth. I do think, you know, you if you're – Looking to draft, they've got to find. I mean, I, look, Cam Hayward, great player, uh, 33. How much gas does he have left in the tank? You know, you, they still got to figure out what to do with middle linebacker. The second, the cornerbacks have been an issue. I mean, you got Minka back there, but on the corner, on the outside, it's not great. So, I mean, I think that their hope is to to, to continue to do kind of stick to their model, right? They they're, they're going to have a little bit more money uh, to spend in the offseason. I certainly think they're going to look for help defensively, but I mean, I think that. And this, to me, reminds me a little bit of what happened in 2013, where they started two and six. They got their doors blown off in uh, New England on a, a late Sunday feature game. The Patriots had 600 and some yards total offense against a Dick LeBeau defense. Uh, the defense was was growing old. Tro Troy was aging. Ryan Clark was aging. James Harrison was aging. And they rebuilt the defense on the fly with guys like, you know, in the next couple of years with guys like Ryan Shazier. And then all of a sudden, it, and the offense kind of held the fort down while they rebuilt. They went eight and eight that year. And then the next year they won the division, lost to the Ravens at home on a, on, in a playoff game in the first round. But then they, and then they were back in the playoffs. So I sort of think this is like where they're at. They're rebuilding the offense on the fly. The defense, the goal is to have the defense hold the fort. And then maybe they have a, 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 a little bit of a window the next two or three years where you still got Minka, prime Minka Fitzpatrick, prime TJ Watt maybe sort of an Indian summer type situation for Cam Hayward. You find, a, you know, a couple guys in the trenches. I mean, that's one of the other things. They haven't drafted an offensive lineman in the first round since David DeCastro in 2012, right? So, I mean, wow. They, well, okay. But, so but, 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 why, but the flip side of that is why would you blame them? They turned Alejandro Villanueva into a pro bowler. I mean, this was a guy that was a tight, a practice squad guy at the Eagles and was a defensive end and then a tight end. They turned him into a left tackle. They've got guys like they turn guys like Kevin Be Kelvin Beecham, you know, before he left to go to the Jets and elsewhere into, into a, a Pro Bowl level, level player. So they had Ramon Foster, remember, was an undrafted free agent that they turned into a, 
an eight year starter. So I think that's one of the reasons they thought they could sort of ignore the offensive line. What they're finding out is you, you, at some point you can't really do that uh, over an extended period of time. So I, I think that that is, you know, they're playing in the off season. They've got their quarterback, they've got their running back, they've got their receiver. They need to re they need to replenish the trenches. If they can do that, I think, you know, I think they're, and when you, I mean, look, this is a quote bad year. They're going to win seven games at least, maybe eight, maybe hell, maybe not. With a rookie quarterback that right. nobody so, else really believes in, right? Right. So I, I think that, you know, I think that they think when you look at the nature of, the, I mean, this division's, I think the division's pretty good. I think the division is set up to be good, assuming Lamar stays. Like the division's going to be, the next five years is going to be, there's no going to be like Cleveland sucks, Cincinnati sucks. Like that's, and it's just the Ravens and the Steelers. That's over, or at least for in the, in the short term. I mean, I think it's definitely like a, these four teams are going to be within two games, two, three games of each other, I think, for the next four or five years. Well, the Ravens have the division four out of the next five weeks with maybe their backup quarterback, at least for a couple of these, and maybe a gimpy version of him uh, trying to desperately get in the next couple of weeks. We'll find out how far ahead. We like all year long. Oh, we're so much better than the, eh, the Bengals. They were fluke. Now you got to go beat these teams. And it, it, doesn't feel like seasonal around here. Doesn't feel like John was serving eggnog and nutmeg on uh, Monday right. out of Owings Mills, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think their season is weird. They should probably be, what, 10-2? and two? Oh, my God. Um, no, no, no. The first 11 games, they had double-digit leads in the second half. No other – three teams in the history, right. the history of football have done that. They all were 11-0, and 0, and the Ravens were 7-4. and four. Yeah, that's – I mean, that is the weird part. I mean, that Dolphins game, the Jags game. I mean, it's it is a weird – uh, the Steelers blew leads, but not ones that substantial just because they don't score enough points to build double digit leads. Right. Um, but I still think when you look at that a bit, I, I look at it, I'm, I take it more of the view of, well, hell, they they were able to get leads that big. They're pretty good. So I think I look at because of the track record Harbaugh has, I look at it as that's the team that I see, the team that's really capable and not so much what's happened in the collapses. I just think like the track record of means they, they're giving the benefit of the doubt for me. Look at oh, the, and I think they're giving the benefit of the doubt by gamblers, by everybody. They're the Ravens. Let's see how they do. But backup quarterback this week, this is a really tough, tough road assignment yeah. for the Ravens here. It is, going but I mean, if they, can, if they can run the ball, um, and the Steelers' defense has been okay, but I mean, even heck, last week Atlanta, they knew Atlanta was going to run the ball. And they all, they, I mean, Atlanta almost stole it in the second half. I mean, they they grounded. I mean, because the lead was only you know ten points or whatever, they they grounded and pounded their way back into the game. So that's kind of the way that I. That's kind of the way that I. It's going to be ugly. It does. It wouldn't matter if Lamar or Ty. Let's remember the Steelers have been pretty good against Lamar. They made Lamar look pretty average at times. So I don't know if Tyler is going to be this. You know, Huntley's going to be this massive drop off for them. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it's going to be this game is going to be 16-13, 13-10. You know, somebody if the defense if a defense on either side makes a big play, a, a, a pick six, a, a big fumble recovery, whatever, that's probably going to be the because that's the script for both of these teams now. Right. I mean, it's basically just like. Try to hold it and keep a lid on it and then hope you make the, the two plays at the end of the game that make the difference. He is Will Graves, and uh, as it says right here on his Twitter, he writes a lot about a lot. Uh, you can find him at Will Graves AP. He is with the Associated Press up in Pittsburgh, taking care of his kids, living his best life out there in western Pennsylvania, getting his snow shovel together uh, and ready to enjoy the holidays. Will, it's always great to visit with you. I hope to visit with you again really soon, personally, All nearby right, in Pittsburgh, sometime soon. Behavior, behave yourself, please. Uh, always, or... <laughs> I follow the rules most of the time. <laughs> I am Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking Baltimore positive.